you got quite an ovation, didn't you? It's so, it's so crass to get a standing ovation however you can, you know, Walter, it's really... Uh, no, I know, it must be when you decide to leave. Are you feeling that way? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> they like us a lot better now, right? I know. Yeah. He, Jeff and I are in the category of forgotten but not gone, right? right. So... I, t I, told my, I told my successor, you know, every job looks easy when you're not the one doing it, so... That you can say the same thing to yours. They still haven't picked my successor, but the entire back of that room are the candidates because it's a, it's a really good job to have. I wish, uh, so tell me, uh, why did you decide to step down? Look, I think 16 years of leading a company like GE is a lifetime. Uh, we had a group of, uh, I would say, candidates in place. I think a lot of the lifting around the portfolio and stuff like that was behind us. And I think when those things converge, it's time to move on. You know, my, my successor did it for 20 years. It's not a 20-year job today. You had spent and 35 years. 35 years in total with the company, yeah. right? So it's from the time I was 26 years old. And personally, I wanted to do one more thing in my life well. And I felt like this was a good time to make that change. Well, it's leaping ahead to the way you normally do an interview, but you raised it. What type of thing, if you have one more thing to do, what are you thinking of? So look, I, I'd like to, you know, I've, I've run a big company. So I've run a you know, $135 billion company, global company. Uh, I've seen it go through transitions and change. And I'm, I think what satisfies somebody that's done what I've done is kind of this notion of building something, seeing something scale, building culture, things like that. And so what I'd like to do is apply what I've learned and, and do something purposeful, but only one thing, where I can apply some of the things I've learned. In other words, not have a portfolio. Not have a portfolio, really. I, the, the thought of joining three or four boards, I find to be depressing, really. Is that from so, dealing with so, your own board? So, <laughs> so I think, uh, but I, I think there's a lot something like me has to offer in a place like uh, in tech or in healthcare or something like that. But I've, as I've thought about it, Really, my focus is going to be to do one thing well. So in other words, take to scale a company that is either in tech or health that might need adult supervision or something. I mean, Eric Schmidt did that. Is that the model? Yeah, that, that, I'd say that's, that's kind of the model. And I, I look at all the change that's going on in tech, all the change that's going on in healthcare. And in some ways, I've kind of experienced that and lived through that on my own. And I just think there's a lot I can offer to that. And I want to be purposeful. You know, at the end of the day, it's not anymore about ego, not anymore about money. It's really more about purpose. And, you know, I've, I'm young enough to do that, and that's what I'd like to do. You know, that's one of the themes at the Institute, is leading a purposeful life. What do you mean by that? Oh, I think it's, it's the notion that you're doing something that has a bigger impact than what uh, just you are about, or what you bring, that, that basically the collective matters, right? So if you think about a company like ours that provides electricity or transportation or jet engines or healthcare products, uh, nobody comes really to work for a company like GE unless they believe in the mission and they want to really drive technology or sales or the things they do on a global basis. So. You know, look, really, I would say even today, uh, the recruiting pitch I would use on campus is if you come to work for GE, in many ways you're going to sit in the front seat of history. Uh, how well American companies do in China, we're going to be there. Uh, how well the internet does in the industrial area, we're going to be there. What happens to the future of healthcare, we're going to be there. And as much as I respect, uh, look, I, I immensely respect. Amazon and Google and Facebook and all the companies that have grown, for them to be the same age as GE, we're going to be in the year like 2130. And we'll see what they're doing and what they look like. And so this, this resiliency and enduring nature of the company is something that's really turned me on. And that's, that's what I mean by, by purpose. We, we have a $30 billion aircraft engine business, and we still have people that go to the airport and watch planes land, right? That's what they love to do. That's their, that's their, that's their passion, and I, and I like companies like that, right? 
<laughs> so we got a little music to go with that yeah, too. No, that yeah. Was, yeah. Is that for your uh, retirement? No, 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 or, no that's yeah. for the purposeful company. <laughs> uh, so have you ever had a conflict in running GE between something that would maximize a quarterly return versus something that would be purposeful? Yeah, look, I think every quarter, <laughs> you know, in other words, yeah. I think, you know, in other words, I think if you're a public company, you have a, um, you have multiple responsibilities. My name is not above the door. The company's owned by investors. You get a shifting group of investors, and I've never really shied away from that. Uh, customers are extremely uh, important. Our customers really determine our success. We measure market share as much as we measure any metric uh, in, in, the, in the company. And we have 300,000 uh, colleagues around the world who really have to come to work today, every day, and be motivated. I think what sh the best you can do, Walter, is to be transparent, right? So I took over the company September 11th, or September 7th, uh, 2001. September 11th happened, right? We were big in the aviation business. We had all the reinsurance on the World Trade Center. So we take a billion dollar charge that week, and the market opens the next Monday, and our biggest investor sells half their stake, a couple hundred million shares. We get crushed. I kind of said, you know, dude, just slow down a little bit. You know, you're scaring people here. And he said, well, I didn't realize that you were that big in insurance. And I said, well, that's your problem, really, not mine, exactly. You know, in other words, if you own 400 million shares of G stock, mm -hmm. and you didn't really know that's what the exposure was, that's a shared responsibility. So I think where CEOs get in trouble, and where I haven't always been perfect, but, but we all, is just total transparency. This is what you're investing in. This is how the business works. This is what we sign up for. If we miss it, it's on us. But if you own GE stock and you don't think you're in the aviation business, you're in the wrong company. And so I just think transparency, you know, in 2001, so I, I go 2001 to 2017. 2001, the word transparency was almost never used fundamentally, right? You, you go read a balance sheet or a 10K from that era, that then. 10K now is uh, as big as a phone book, right? So I think, I think this notion of transparency is such an important one with all constituencies. And if, you, if you're out there, if you're open, if you tell the truth, you're gonna be able to navigate between all three. You've basically turned GE into a technology company. Do you think both for General Electric and for America in general, technology over the next 10 years will destroy jobs or create jobs? Well, I'd give you, I'd give you two, um, Two ideas. The first one I'd say, if you're an investor or just looking at companies and things like that, having some kind of technology leadership or moat is actually quite important, whether it's in a platform, whether it's in search, whether it's in data, whether it's in material science. So when I look at companies or just industries in general, I always start there. But I, I, think, I think we get lost sometimes in technology, and we want to see episode 10 before we live the pathway of what technology can bring. So right now we have 300,000 people that work for GE. None of them have had a productive day today, not one of them. Not one of them have experienced the hope of technology, digitization, not one. Now let's say right now we have a field engineer in Texas that's fixing a gas turbine What's possible for him or her is with 5G, they can get 40 years of experience now in virtual reality. They can fix that gas turbine right the first time. They can have all the expertise that any artificial intelligence would have. They're, that's amazing for them. It's gonna make them more valuable. They're gonna earn more money. That's great. I don't know why we have to go all the way to we're all gonna be robots, right? Why can't we just go through step one, step two, make people more productive. The productivity in this country stinks. It's horrible. Mm -hmm. Yet all the conversation is we're going to skip every step in between and go all the way to robotics. It's just not true. So I would urge everybody to figure out each technology, right? Artificial intelligence. Does that mean there's not going to be any radiologists in the future? No. What it means is every x-ray has to be 15% of all x-rays, which is a pretty old technology, have to be reread. Instead of rereading 15%, you reread zero. That's good for healthcare. That makes the radiologist better. And let's just start there. So, so how I, do I you train getting... your workers to do that? 
Oh, look, I mean, I think what we try to do is marry people with technology. So, you know, kind of our focus is really to take the people that are on the front lines and marry them to how the future of work is going to look and make them more productive. And so that's why in a manufacturing... Wait, wait, what is the future of work going to look like at GE? Look, I think what you do is you take administrative work, factory work, field work, engineering work, global work. You apply where the technologies go, what, what it's going to mean. And so it says for a manufacturing person, instead of doing maybe discrete assembly line manufacturing, what they're really doing is kind of material design, making the part at the same time, and doing multiple tasks. And for that, they're going to get paid $30 an hour, right? Mm -hmm. Their value added is going to be so complete. So you're marrying them to the technology. So there's going to be some repetitive tasks that get replaced. But I think it's going to make a lot of people in factories, in the field, in, place, in engineering, a lot more valuable than they are today. You're mainly uh, in healthcare too. I mean, a huge healthcare company. What is the future of healthcare? What's the big thing coming next in healthcare for you? Look, I mean, I think I would mix uh, public policy and technology in healthcare. And I would say, uh, I know we're debating it right now. I, I ran our healthcare business. We're a big payer in healthcare. You know, we've been doing employee healthcare since 1947. If anybody thinks anybody's going to solve healthcare this year, you're crazy. We're going to be working on healthcare for the rest of our lives, and everybody's going to pay more. People are going to pay more, the government's going to pay more, companies are going to pay more. So let's get those two things out of the way in the beginning. And then I'd give everybody four things to think about as it pertains to healthcare. Uh, one is consumerism. You're never going to fix healthcare unless you link the consumer with the provider. And the sooner that happens and people think about their own wellness in a constructive way, that's got to happen. Wait, explain what you mean by consumer to the provider. Look, um, you pay for some of your health care. We market? went in 2010, uh, 2011, GE went to kind of HSAs, a high deductible plan mm -hmm. with our workforce. My wife and I had never read the GE benefits plan. And I ran the place, right? So <laughs> that was the first time we sat down and said, OK, how much do, how much do we want to pay? What's the cost? And that's, you know, pretty sophisticated buyer in a big company. So we, we're completely divorced between the people, how healthy they want to be. Do, when they sprain their ankle on a Sunday, do they want to go to the emergency room or grab a bag of ice? And then if, you, if you're sick, if you have pancreatic cancer or something like that, we need to take care of you. We, we, we need to make sure people, so, so that's consumerism. Uh, chronic disease, 70% of all healthcare dollars are spent on chronic disease. That's only going to get worse because people are going to live longer. And if people start dying of aging diseases, there's no way to estimate what the cost is going to be. So chronic disease matters. Uh, low cost systems, G's big in 15 cities in the US. The difference in cost per patient, the low city to high city is 50%. So just by the function of where you live. So getting variance reduction into the system, that's important. And then payment reform. We just have horrible incentives on payment reform. So let's fix one or two of those things. Let's work on them sequentially. But the notion, Walter, that like every time, so we basically, from the 1970s or 60s until 2010, we worked in contextually the same healthcare system in the United States. So now if we have to change healthcare plans every time there's an election, so if we're now on four-year cycles with 20% of the country's economy, we're in a bad place. Mm -hmm. So I think that's all I would offer. So my real answer on healthcare is I don't know. But, but, what about but those the, are some ideas. Those about, are some ideas anyhow on what, what some of the problems might be. But what about the technology of healthcare? Technology, what are you building so, now that's going to be particularly interesting in our lives? So look, I, I'd say the ability to, um, I'd give you two things. The ability to diagnose disease earlier and treat it more effectively. 40% of the time when you have cancer, you get sent home on the wrong protocol when you come home from the hospital. So marrying imaging technology with therapies so that you get the right therapy out of the box, hugely important. The other one is cell therapy, you know, the ability to kind of do vein to vein mm -hmm. uh, cell therapy as a way to, to kind of uh, treat disease or cure disease. Those are massively important. On the technology side, as Americans, we should, we should feel great about where the innovation is. It's just we can't afford it. That's, that's the challenge. 
Uh, as a company, you know, from aircraft engines to locomotives to energy and everything else, you could probably do more to fight climate change than almost any other entity. How much does climate change affect the decisions you make and the products you make and then the policies that you try to advocate? So in 2005, we had a group of our scientists study. We did a red team, blue team around climate. And, and we kind of studied public policy, things like that. Um, we kind of decided climate change was real, but you know, I, I didn't have like, uh, you know, I wasn't an environmentalist. I, I had never camped, right? Anything like that. So I was, I was a pure agnostic, show me the data, show me the proof, that would be. And so we had our own researchers do red team, blue team. They came back, said that. So from 2000 and basically five until today, We've had a huge clean energy initiative, wind turbine, solar, clean gas turbines, uh, water, things like that. And cumulative over that time period, that's $300 billion of revenue. So we've, re we've reduced our own carbon footprint by a third. We've generated $300 billion of revenue and we've improved our productivity. So I'd say in the world of business, we're kind of past this. We're, we're past the political side. The world of business is, is kind of just, you know, hey, let's go. And the other stuff is just, you know, it's, it's not like, it's not like Tom Fanning, listened, who runs Southern Company, listened to us not joining Paris and said, okay, I'm gonna go build a coal plant. That's just, you know, we're past it all. So I, I would say, uh, you know, public policy helps, but mainly these ideas are investable. You know, we, we joined the, got in the wind business in 2002. Wind was 30 cents a kilowatt, right? 30 cents. We now are on the grid at three. So that's learning curve, that's innovation. So we've never viewed this as an elitist initiative. One of the things that happens in environmentalists is it can be too elite, too special. We've always made it grunty. We've always made it about science. We've always made it about technology. We've always made it about people. We've always made it about commerce. And I think when you think about this as a problem to be solved with innovation and not a red state, blue state, or an elitist thing, so That's you're big in the wind turbine business. It, does it not hurt you when policy changes and it's the subsidies? Look, there? I mean, I think clarity is always the best, but you know, we have the advantage now, 70% of our revenue is outside the United States. If the US doesn't work in wind, Australia will, or Canada will, or China will, or Germany will, and we'll go you know, someplace else. We have 1,000 people that make wind turbine blades in North Dakota, you know, red state. They better believe in energy efficiency or else they're not gonna believe in themselves. So I just think, you know, the politics, this is one case, I would say one among many, where, and not that business is perfect, guys, I'm not, I'm not here to say that, where business is way ahead of government and, and it has been that way for a long time and will continue to be ahead. Actually, you tweeted on climate change. Did you get a reaction from the president? Not yet. Thanks. Thanks, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Right. Thanks, by the way. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, you're, you're out there saying. Yeah, look, I mean, I, th I think most times business people should keep their mouth shut, really, and, and, unless you bring something unique. So the two places where I've spoken up over time, one is globalization, uh, because we see the world, you know, differently. You know, really, uh, I, I, I see the world retail, uh, not, not, not wholesale. So I, you know, we have thousands of people, commerce on the ground, so we can, we have a voice in globalization. And then the other places people like, you know, we've had a clean energy initiative for 12 years. We have tens of thousands of people that are working on it. If you're not willing to stand up for your own people, you're kind of a coward, really. So I, I think those are the only two times when I speak up is when we have a unique voice or when it's supporting the people that I work with every day. In, in an initiative that we think is important. Globalization has been one of your strands, but it's kind of difficult dealing in China now. You've been pretty successful at it, though. What's happening with China in terms of the economic as well as political uh, competition with the So, US? you know, what I would say, Walter, is we, you know, I joined you in 1982, and I'm retiring this year, 2017, 35 years. So in, in 1982, 80% of G's revenue was in the U.S., in 2017, almost 70% is gonna be outside the United States, right? So that's one generation. 
And we, you know, again, used to do globalization tops down. Now we do globalization bottoms up. So we believe very much in localization. We have very strong, you know, teams in each one of these countries. So in China, we do $10 billion of revenue. We have 23,000 people. We have 20 factories. We are, it's run by a woman who has worked for GE for 25 years. She went to college in China. She went to business school in the United States. And that's where globalization is today. So, you know, we have the ability to kind of straddle between uh, both places. You know, my job is to make sure we're a good American citizen, which is important to us, but still know how to be a good partner around the world. And, and American business has had 70 years to get globalization right. If you're a company our age and you still need the government to help you globalize, there's something wrong with you. So I kind of view globalization as something we're accountable for and basically say to the government, look, fix infrastructure, get tax reform, leave us on our own outside the United States, and we'll, we'll fight our own battles and, and try to navigate a very complicated world. But we're, you know, President Trump didn't invent uh, protectionism. This has been underway for a decade. China is protectionistic. You're, you know, don't let anybody convince you that we're unique in this vein. This has been going on, I would say, for the last 15 years. And we just have to navigate between it. Localization, you know, what I would call connected localization, using digital technology, things like that. That's really what the world is about for us today. You make turbine blades, you said, in North Dakota. You have even, I think, some locomotives, other yeah. things. What would it take for you to increase by 20, 30 percent the amount of actual manufacturing you do in the United States? Look, I think the, um, uh, we can make things as inexpensively in the U.S. today as almost any place else. Uh, globalization for me in the 1980s was shutting factories in the U.S. and moving them to Mexico f purely for the purpose of wage arbitrage. Those days were over, really. Uh, today we globalize really for the purpose of uh, serving our customers, getting a local presence in a country, things like that. So we're a big exporter from the United States. We're a $20 billion exporter. We're second only to Boeing, so we still make a lot of stuff here. I think while we're in the US, we're in a 15-year investment recession in the United States. So one of the things that would make the US do better is a better economy. We would make a lot more things here if the demand was better in the US. So, so fundamentally, whatever tax reform or whatever else it is, on the investment side, the US has been a laggard for the past uh, 10 or 15 years. And then I'd say the other thing is a real desire by, let's say, U.S. Inc. to participate more broadly outside the United States, right? Germany runs their entire country to be an export country. From the politics, through the industrial plans, through the small and medium enterprises, if we were more like Germany, our exports would be higher. I don't think about China. China's, you know, state-run capitalism, we're not going to copy that model, but we can be more German if we wanted to. You know, Germany's 24% manufacturing, They're, they run a huge trade surplus with us. Those are some of the things that I think help the country. I, I remember David Bradley's here and you were in Washington and one of the things, and you were talking about trying to navigate the age of Trump. What is it like to deal with the White House, the age of Trump, where you're nonpartisan, as far as I know, but you're trying to deal with a totally different type of administration? Thanks, Walter. <laughs> Thanks for that question. <laughs> you didn't deflect it. Uh, no, I think, look, I think, um, you know, first and foremost, it's to run a good company. You know, we're business people. Um, we should participate politically when it's meaningful or when we should, but most of the time, like I said, we should just run our companies and, uh, and run them successfully. I, I think Today, in my mind, it's really agreeing on those things that we think are good and agreeable, and disagree on those things which we think are uh, disagreeable. Be willing to speak up personally. So in other words, we don't sign letters anymore. We don't sign 100 company letters anymore. I think that's, you know, we let our own voice speak for ourselves. So I would say uh, agree, disagree, speak for yourself. Mm -hmm. If you can't stand, if you have to join a hundred company letter to let your voice be heard, your voice isn't being heard. It doesn't really matter, right? So, so I would say those three things, and, and we're true 
again, we're not perfect. There's a lot of things to pick on in GE, but we're kind of true to who we are. We're, we're, we're true to who we are. We stand up for certain things. You know, so I'd be the first person to say today, this country needs a bilateral relationship with China. The notion of the two biggest economies in the world that don't have a, a meaningful bilateral relationship, I don't know how many people in this room think that's a good idea. I don't, I don't get it, right? So I'm willing to say that even. And what about though, Mexico? I think NAFTA's, e look, NAFTA's easier in some ways because one of the strengths that our country has is we have good neighbors, right? We're not next door to North Korea. We don't have guys shooting missiles. It's not like the Canadians are at the border ready to come down and take our stuff, you know? So we've got relatively good uh, people. But the problem is, is that we're trying to talk about NAFTA today. If the only defense for Mexico in, 19, or in 2017 is cheap labor, the same argument people made in 1992, that's a loser. That's where business is tone deaf. That, that's, where, that's where businesses, if that's going to be the case we make, is that our supply chains are so low cost, and if we don't have NAFTA, everybody's going to pay more at the grocery store. That's a loser in 2017. So sometimes business people, we run the old play, and, and I think with NAFTA, we just need a new play. But, but, a, but a good, not agreeable, but a strong bilateral relationship with China, everybody in this room uh, needs that. And the Paris Accord, Climate Accord? Look, I think it's always good um, when the U.S. engages. So, in other words, I used to say to President Obama, don't do, don't do trade deals for GE. We don't really need them anymore. If, if we can't navigate the world on our own, do them for yourself. In other words, the U.S. has a powerful military. We also have the world's best economy. If the President of the United States is using both of those, he's stronger. And, and if, we, if we just have a military, but we don't interconnect our economy with anybody in the rest of the world, we're weaker as a country. So I, I'm not for the Paris Accord because it indicates where we invest. We're gonna make the same investments we're gonna make. But I worry about it in, in the regard of it doesn't make, it doesn't project strength that we want our country to have on the global stage. And I, I think we have such a unique country, that's, that's giving something up. Why did you move the headquarters to Boston? Well, look, I wanted to be in it. We were in Connecticut for 40 years, so we were a New York City company when Edison founded the company. We moved to Connecticut because the CEO lived there and got tired of commuting in, into, New, into New York, and the taxes were zero back in the day. I think uh, we wanted to be in the city, right? So I'm rarely in the office, but when I was in my office in Connecticut and I would look out my window, I would see nothing. Right? I would see a deer running through a field, uh, hopefully running across the merit without getting killed, although that wasn't always the case. When I look out my window in Boston, I see a dozen startups, uh, Fidelity, one of our biggest owners, and it's, you just get a different vibe, and it makes you on the edge of your chair. And I think, we, particularly when you're an old company, you really need to get something new in your brain every day, or else you just run the risk of becoming obsolete. We don't want to do that. And you've invested in a lot. I see Mayor Landrieu there and some people from New Orleans. You did a big investment in New Orleans. Do you think cities are coming back as sort of the creative generator of the new economies? I, I really do think that there's something to be said for that. And then I think cities build ecosystems. So when we build a factory today, we tend to want to be around a college campus, right? And, and it's not just because we get from the college campus, but those tend to have the best high schools. So when we build a new factory, we want to be where the best high schools are. We want to be around where we can train people. Similarly, when you build a software center, you want to be in uh, a place where there's people. We went to New Orleans with Mitch in 2010, more or less. We didn't really know what we were getting ourselves into. You had to have a vision. Sorry, Mitch, but you had to have had a vision in 2010 to be dropping a big investment in New Orleans. Sorry, Walter. Uh, it's a great city. And then what's, what's happened in the subsequent time is that New Orleans, has, New Orleans has become a really great kind of tier two software city. So Silicon Valley is still an amazing place for talent. Seattle's still an amazing place for talent. But then you can drop down to New Orleans or Austin or Chicago, a few other places. So it's now got a tailwind all its own. And we were in on the ground floor of that, and that's gonna pay dividends. 
And finally, if there's just sort of one great piece of advice for America now, whether it's investing in infrastructure, education, whatever it would be to make us competitive, give us a piece of, you know, most important call. Look, I would say uh, for the country, for the long term, it's definitely education. Uh, we can't be a rich country if we don't have uh, well-trained people, and we're, we've way fallen behind there. And then I just give everybody in the room simple arithmetic, right? 2% GDP growth solves no problems in this country. Doesn't solve health care, doesn't solve social security, solves zero problems. 3% GDP growth, we have a shot. The difference between 2% and 3% is to get people reinvesting back in the country. Reinvesting back in the country. Not buying clothes, uh, not buying companies, but building factories. So what's going to make that happen? It's going to be uh, infrastructure, maybe tax reform. And so I would look at it just not from a G standpoint, but sheer arithmetic. Our arithmetic right now doesn't work. In order to get our arithmetic to work, we've got to grow faster. In order to grow faster, we've got to get people investing again. People aren't investing. Even right now, demand for loans is sluggish at best. So education, get people investing again. Those two things. Thank you Ray very Walter, much, Great Walter, good to be with you. Congratulations. Great. Congratulations to you.